Well, it sure was a pleasure to listen to Sue. She and I trained together at uh, New Bolton Center. We have so many fond memories going back there. There are several people that, that uh, we stay in touch with to this day. But, you know, she did her studies at New Bolton Center, but she got her degree from the University of Delaware, which isn't very far down the road. And her mentor, her major professor there, never could get my name straight. My name is Dixon Varner. You wouldn't think that would be a difficult name, but he always called me Farnsley Dixworth, and he never could get over it. So, <laughs> so don't call me Farnsley. It really is upsetting. And then I did some work at Coolmore one time, and Coolmore named a horse after me, a racehorse. And I was so excited to hear about that when they called me. But then I noticed that they misspelled my name. It was D-I-X-O-N rather than D-I-C-K-S-O-N. And he was also a Geldon. So I went to that main <laughs> office and talked to him about it. <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to have some fun here. I, I probably, I don't know if you all remember Dan Quayle. He was a vice president for George H.W. Bush. He said something one time. He said, before I start to talk, I want to say something. So before I start to talk, I want to say something here. And that is that when anybody ever gets up in front of you, you need to know their credentials. That's, that's imperative. And when I come over here to England, it seems like most of the time the credentials fall off the end of the page. If Sid, Sid Ricketts was up here, you wouldn't be able to see all of his credentials, would you? Well, so I want to tell you, I'm a DVM, I have a master's degree, I'm a diplomate of the ACT, I'm also AMM and STHA. AMM, anybody know what that is? I'm a card-carrying American mountain man. So I, you know, that means a lot to me, so I thought I'd better put it up here. <laughs> and STHA, I don't know of another scientist that has this award, but I got two years ago the Silver Tomahawk Award through the American Mountain Man, and they put me on the front cover of the Tomahawk and live Long Rifle. Now that's better than being on the cover of the Rolling Stone, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that's, it's really been neat. No matter what we do in life, we need to have an escape. Sometimes you need to have an escape from society, but you need to have an escape from work. And my big escape is, is going out in the wilderness and, uh, and just living out there and living off the land. And this American Mountain Man group, it's, it's a fascinating group because you can only go out there with equipment that was available in the fur trade era. And we're talking 1800 to 1840. So you're in handmade brain tan buckskins, you have a flintlock rifle, flintlock pistol, you have a tomahawk, you have a bowie knife, camp knife, and a compass that'll get you. Last year we went about 600 miles, and you just ride through the wilderness to a rendezvous site, and it's really fascinating. You, you, you need to experience that sometime in your life if you haven't gotten out to do that. These are some of the fellows that I travel with, so we don't have cameras with us. They're disallowed, and plus we... We, we don't want folks to see what's on our tripod sometimes, but, but this, this is the group I oftentimes travel with. And this is me in the middle, and I'm looking at a fellow by the name of Bearclaw. Bearclaw lives in the mountains in Idaho, in the wilderness, squats up there, lives in a dugout, and he makes about $500 a year. Can you imagine that? And he's happy as a clam. And, uh, but it got ruined because a, a group by the name of National Geographic found out about him, and they gave him $8,000 to do six weeks of filming for a show that they were going to put out. So I asked him this last year. I said, gosh, Bearclaw, you probably feel like a millionaire now, don't you? He said, you know, he said, I had to ride two and a half days to get to a place where the people could cash a check. He gets his mail a long way away. They got the check, they cashed it, gave it to him, and he put it in a mason jar, rode back up in the wilderness, and buried it. He said, you know, he said, I don't need that kind of money. He said, what do you, what do you need money for unless you're just really sick or just need to go to town? 
So it's, it's a fascinating group. These fellows, the fellow on the far left and right, the fellow on the right is the son of the fellow on the left. When the fellow on the right was only 10 years old, they rode primitive style all the way from the Canadian to the Mexican border. So these folks just lived the life. And, and uh, tell me if you want to come out one of these days. You'd have a lot of fun. <laughs> this is some of the country we ride in. Beautiful country. So we got a tough topic. And, um, you know, I feel like I'm in a church with everybody in the back pews over there being way up front here, but I can't move very far forward because they said that they were going to film this today. and That made me extra nervous because I feel like if I need to scratch myself, I don't want you to think I'm a sneak breeder and I <laughs> feel like I need to get behind the podium. <laughs> so this is a difficult topic. It's a difficult topic because we could be here for a week. We could literally be here for a week to talk about stallion management eight hours a day, and it would be good to have some wet labs with it, but we don't have that possibility, so we're just going to kind of skim the surface, and if you have questions, we can, we can focus in on, on some of your queries to see if we can answer them. But basically, I was asked to speak about stallion management. Well, where does it begin? Well, I'd say, first of all, stallion management probably would begin with a breeding soundness examination. You need to see what a stallion is capable of doing with regard to handling a, a satisfactory book of mares. So you would look at things like mating ability, look at things like libido, like Sue was talking about, to look at sperm or semen quality. You can look at some of these traditional tests as well. And I, I just put these up just to give you an idea of what can be done to assess sperm quality to see if it's going to be satisfactory, whether or not a stallion looks like you'll have the potential to handle a full book of mares. Well, look at those up there. What would you select if you had to take the three tests that you think are the most important to evaluate semen quality? What would you select? The ones I would select are these, sperm morphology, testicular size, and sperm chromatin integrity. And I just briefly talk about this. We won't go in depth to why I've selected those, but oftentimes we think in terms of sperm motility. But you're, you're intercepting semen that's coming out of the stallion, going into the mare reproductive tract, and, and it's so susceptible to environmental conditions. We have somebody in the audience, Warren Hohurst, who just had a poster at the meeting we just attended on the toxic properties of artificial vagina rubber. So think about all of these things when you try to intercept that semen. We won't say, and it's, we won't say it's going to the protective confines of the uterus because the uterus is a very harsh environment for sperm. But these sperm can gain access into the oviduct fairly quickly. Within four hours, the sperm that are going to fertilize are probably in the oviduct. Let me ask you a question here. If we put five billion sperm in a mare's uterus, whether she was bred by natural cover or artificial insemination, what percent of those sperm that you deposit in the uterus would get into the oviduct? 10%? Anybody say 10? Anybody say 30? Anybody say 1? All right, we got a few 1s. Well, it's actually 0.0007%. So uh, of all of the sperm that a stallion puts in a mare, um, not many of them get to the site of fertilization. And we're going to talk about that briefly when we talk about artificial insemination programs. Now, here I am in the middle of Newmarket, and I do a lot of work in the thoroughbred industry, but I don't know how many people are, are coming from other locations in um, England where you're doing artificial insemination. So let's have a show of hands of people that are doing some artificial insemination. So we got a group. Yeah, it's good that you all hang together because it's, it's probably never, not a healthy environment here, but... <laughs> we need some stewards to kind of 
get around and protect you over there. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And if you have questions afterwards, you can talk to me. But a lot of the focus that I have will be on Steins and natural cover type of programs. Now, Dave, if you could tell me when I have 10 minutes left, there's no, I don't see a watch up here and, or a clock, and I can't wear a watch. It hurts my nose, so I, I'm going to have to have some help up here. So when we talk in terms of fertility, we have three things that we need to give consideration to. We have intrinsic fertility of the stallion, of the mare, and management. Now, that seems... Logical, doesn't it? But we could talk on this. Katrin Hendricks, who's going to be visiting with a, a group later today, she and I went to a talk one time, and our, one of our mentors, John Hurchin, went to a meeting to talk 50 minutes on stallion management. He started with this slide. He had about 50 slides, and with five minutes to go on the front row... I said, John, you got five minutes left. And so he went through the rest of the slides. He, took, he spent most of that hour talking about this triangle right here. So we're going to get off it right away. And, but appreciate that these are very important. And to show you how important they are, here's some work that a colleague of mine led. He presented it at the AAP. And this was a thoroughbred breeding operation. And he looked at the effect of the boarding farm where the mares were located. He looked at mare intrinsic fertility factors. He looked at stallion intrinsic fertility factors. And look at this. The stallion only accounted for about a third of the fertility equation. So that's something that's really important to recognize. Mare, 50%. It's a big number. I can't believe that it's that high. I think it's the all of the kerosene that they tend to use in some of these places that probably affects the fertility of those mares. Hard to say. So, just basically to review again, intrinsic stallion factors. When we see what a stallion is capable of doing, we want to look at semen quality. We want to look at sperm number. Remember the first slide I had indicated that I think testicular size is very important. And that's because if you collect one ejaculate from a stallion, he might give you 20 billion sperm, he might give you 6 billion sperm. How do you interpret that? Well, you, you can't interpret it unless the stallion has been regularly breeding and he is at what we refer to as daily sperm output. In other words, if you collect semen from that stallion once a day, over 10 days, how many sperm is he going to give in a 24-hour time period? Now think about this. How many sperm do you think a stallion produces from the testis on a second basis? Every second. Every second the average stallion produces about 70 or 80 thousand sperm. That's an amazing number, isn't it? If you look, just some trivia here, throw it on somebody at a cocktail party one time. If you take the sperm that a stallion has produced over his lifetime and you just put them end to end, do you know how far that sperm track would go? It would go, calculate it yourself sometime, it would go from here to the moon and back over three times. Now that's an impressive number. That, that gives new meaning to shoot the moon, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're getting off the topic here a little bit, but you know, you need to know some of those side ideas. So managerial ch changes. Just think about the thoroughbred world. We go from a book that was a full book 30 years ago of 40 or 45 mares and now, 100 mares is common. 200 mares is common. I know some Irish that might breed 400 mares. How many know them? <laughs> so there are a lot of mares that are bred. So we've intensified the breeding operation. 
how, how can we get by with that? To me, it was kind of a revolutionary thing for them to do. I don't know if it was very good for the mare owners, but for the stallion owners, it was, it was good for income generation. We've gone from single to dual hemisphere breeding. So rather than giving a stallion seven, eight months of rest, that stallion goes out of the breeding shed into quarantine, gets on a plane, and then breeds in the southern hemisphere for another three months or so, three and a half, and then comes back again. So they have no time off, so to speak. And how does that affect them? Well, we just, we just published a paper on a large group of stallions that did dual hemisphere breeding, and the dual hemisphere breeding didn't affect their fertility. But something we ought to know up here in the northern hemisphere is the one thing that came out of that study is that fertility of those stallions was higher in the southern hemisphere than the northern hemisphere. Now, I, I don't know why. You know, they have folks like Angus McKinnon that are doing their work, and, and you know, they said they didn't want crockery in the room. You know, he came in here probably a little crock this morning after that party we had last night. <laughs> but he'd tell you that the fertility is better there. Now, I don't know why the fertility is better down there, but I think one of the things is the fact that they turn these mares out to pasture. You know, we foal our mares in stalls in America, and you do to a large extent here. The mares spend a lot of time in the stall, and I think that's where mare factors come in because they don't have the contractility. They have a lot of fluid in their uterus postpartum. You know, I wish Sue could share some of this information with you, but we were, we were at a meeting in, um, in Lexington. I was at a meeting, and they were talking about mare management strategies. Do you breed on full heat? What's the embryonic loss rate? What's the pregnancy rate? What's the incidence of retained placentas in both those times? And I was on the back of the room, and I just grabbed my phone, and I texted Sue. Sue, are you there? Yep. In your semi-feral pony herd, what's the pregnancy rate at full heat? Now tell me if I'm wrong, but if I recall, she told me 100%. I said, what's the embryonic loss rate? She said essentially zero, if not zero. Was it zero, Sue? Where are you? Did you say zero? She was a little crocked at the time I did that. We've had a couple uh, okay. embryonic losses in, in hundreds of So the incidence is extremely low. It's approaching zero. Probably closer to zero than 1% with hundreds. But uh, that's good information. What's the incidence of retained placenta? We don't see them. Well, what's the incidence of dystocia? She said, well, I've not had any dystocias. Oh, no, I did. I had two fillies that were bred as yearling that had dystocias as two-year-olds. So we can learn a lot from those semi-feral conditions. And I think that, that possibly the folks in the Southern Hemisphere apply that a little better than we might in the Northern Hemisphere. So with AI-type programs, we have advancements in how to cool semen, how to freeze semen. We have methodologies now so we can actually take a single sperm, inject it into an egg, a process called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, and establish pregnancies. We have techniques to do low-dose insemination where we can actually pass a small volume of sperm up to the tip of the oviduct, squirt 100 microliters at the tip of the oviduct, and have pregnancy rates of 70% or better with 500 to 1,000 times fewer sperm than you would normally inseminate with. So just think about the uh, applications of something like that. So let's go back to stallion management. One of the things that we need to think about in stallion management is how they've performed in the past. If that's, that's probably better than any laboratory procedure that can be done. We don't have one laboratory method or a, a battery of tests that can give us an absolute correlation with fertility. 
breeding management doesn't either, but it allows you to see in the most important laboratory of all, the breeding shed, whether or not you're successful. And we have a person that is a Texas A&M that, that uh, just left today to go back to America that was at the meeting, Charlie Love. And he, he developed an Excel program many, many years ago when he was doing a residency in Old Bolton Center. It's an easy program to develop. It's a little bit hard to add things to it um, so that it's a user-friendly program. And I think, I don't know of anybody that Charlie or I that actually uses this program because it is, it's kind of a high learning curve to enter the data. But we've modified it over the, over the years and, and it gives you just a bird's eye view of what a season looks like. And so some of the things that'll do in the green, it'll tell you the number of mares that were covered on a given day in a thoroughbred operation. It gives you the blue, the number of mares that were covered in the previous week. And it gives you a red line here, which we'll call the pregnancy differential. Well, what does that mean? That means <clears throat> that If you breed two mares in a day and you have two pregnancies, you put an X there. The next day, if you breed two mares and they don't get pregnant, you put an X here. So you essentially go up and down. It's similar to what's used, been used for decades in the dairy breeding industry and it has wonderful applications for the stallion. But we can measure fertility changes along the entire breeding season. We can look at effective accumulated breedings, and you'll see that's going to be important here shortly. So we want to know the number of mares that are bred daily. We want to know the number of mares that are bred in the last seven days. We want to know of the mares that are covered three times a day, for instance, what's their pregnancy rate on the first, second, and third breeding sessions. So we have a lot of information that we can plug in. And I actually added something here that I think is a very valuable part of this graph. It shows the same thing as the red line, but it essentially shows the accumulated per cycle pregnancy rate of these stallions. So just think about it. If, you're, if you get a plus one one day and a negative one one day, plus one, negative one, that's a 50% pregnancy rate. So a horizontal line would indicate a 50% pregnancy rate. So you just take one look at that graph. This stallion is fertile. He's climbing every way along that breeding season. He covered 133 mares. He was a cryptorchid stallion. Um, they can do quite well in the breeding shed. Per cycle pregnancy rate, 68% seasonal of 89. So let's look at a subfertile stallion here. How does that help? This stallion had a pretty low book of mares, didn't he? under current standards, 77% seasonal pregnancy rate, 70% seasonal foaling rate, less than 50% pregnancy rate per cycle. So we'll plot his mares out. The number covered in a given day, the number covered in the previous week. And then we add the pregnancy data to it, and you can see with this particular horse, when he starts to get over about 12 mares covered in a week, his fertility declines. So you can spot it just like that. You don't have to review records. You don't have to review tabular information. Sometimes a graphic type of format allows you to see that stuff very readily. You're not going to be able to read all of this except what I have in yellow here, but this is what this program will do. It allows us to determine the number of mares that are bred to the stallion on the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth cycle, the total cycles, total covers, the number of cross covers or doubles that the horse has, pregnancy rate information on each of the cycles. Very importantly, it has the number of mares that are open from the first cycle that are bred a second time, and the number that are open a second cycle that are bred a third time. Why is that important? We have data on over 100,000 mare records from central Kentucky and, and some over here in Europe, and the average mare is bred 
over about one and a half cycles for the entire breeding season. So that's an interesting figure. We have information on maiden mares, foaling mares, mares that had aborted the previous year, mares that were foal late and so were not bred that year and came back. We have information on breeding frequency. What, did they breed one a day, two a day, three a day? How did it affect their fertility? If we had uh, stallions that were rested for a day, they didn't have anything in the breeding shed. What was their fertility after a day of rest? Tells us good information. And then other things like uh, monthly breeding statistics. So I'll give you an example of mare exposure. You can determine the number of mares that are bred on the first cycle, all mares that are covered to the stallion, to get their first cycle pregnancy rate, and of that, determine how many mares are available to come back to the stallion and how many mares actually do. What percent of the mares that are open on the first cycle are covered on a second cycle? Extremely important. When you look at the intrinsic fertility of a stallion, you want to make sure that that stallion has plenty of opportunity, and sometimes you don't have that if you're not allowing the mares to come back. So let's look at this information. These are the additive effects of mare fertility and breeding opportunity on pregnancy rates. There's stallion one, stallion two. Both of them bred about the same number of mares. First cycle pregnancy rate is pretty similar, and it's very good. You look at the number of mares that are bred on the second cycle. It's fewer for stallion one than two. The second cycle pregnancy rate is 53% versus 68. So the mares that were bred here and got pregnant were fertile, but of the ones that come back, you're probably dealing with a more subfertile population of mares, and that is only seen as a stallion-related issue sometimes. So give us some thought to it. You'd like this number to be 90. Look at its drop. The number of mares that were bred on a subsequent on a second cycle that were open to the first cover, only 78%. So as a result, seasonal pregnancy rate is 86% over 93%. So you essentially have about a dozen more mares that are pregnant. Well, if it's a $50,000 stud fee, that adds up. That puts a lot of paint on your fences. Mare category, just quickly here, just to show that, that look at the different mare types, maiden, foaling. Typically, over that 100,000 mares that we have, the fertility is highest in the maiden mares, slightly lower in the foaling mares, and, and always lower in the barren mares. So see what the spread is, the number or the percentages of each that are in that population you're breeding. As a stallion owner, as a stallion manager, you can't control that a lot of times but at least it allows you to determine whether or not indeed you have an intrinsic subfertility stallion problem with your stallion. Look at this. This is the effect of breeding frequency on pregnancy rate. Two thoroughbred stallions. Stallion one only bred 79 mares. Stallion two bred more mares, 126. Look at the pregnancy rate per cycle when stallion one bred one mare a day, 39. Breeds two mares a day, he's 48. Three mares a day, he's 52. On the days where he breeds three mares, the third session, he's 67%. The more he breeds, the better his fertility is. Well, you give him a day off, and look at his fertility dropping. So we think in terms of, of stagnant sperm reserves, of something that occurs over weeks of sexual inactivity. But these stallions, we have stallions that literally, if they don't breed three mares a day, their fertility drops to the point that we encourage that these stallions just breed some test mares. They just need to continue to have their pipes cleaned, and it has to do with some local factors in all likelihood in the epididymal tail that that we need to address. We don't know what's causing this, if, but we know that it is real. And it could be that they, they have some oxidative injury to those cells just because of that milieu and that epididymal environment where they're stored. Look at stallion two. He bred more mares, and his pregnancy rate on one mare a day is 46, drops to 
two a day at 35, drops further to 22. You give him two days off, and he's 67, a day off. So this stallion does better when he breeds less frequently. So basically showing it, this stallion should be breeding fewer mares to get a, a good pregnancy rate per cycle. This stallion needs to be breeding a lot more mares. So subfertility doesn't necessarily mean poor quality semen in a commercial breeding program. It's just a management issue. Well, look at this. This, this involves, if I recall, about 30 stallions over about, um, I think it's about 12,000 maybe mare covers. And this is some work that we had gathered in central Kentucky at, at, at some of the farms there. But, but think about the breeding season of the stallion. In North America, it's about 136 days. So if the book size increases, how does that affect the number of covers these stallions had in a commercial program? breeding up to five times a day in some instances. Well, look at this. You can draw this line at 110, 109, and only 9% of these 136 days was the stallion required to have more than two covers. Pretty impressive, isn't it? He had 10 right here and 11, one four a day out of 136 days. Look at this. He had a total of 11 days where he had more than two covers, he had 30 days where he didn't breed anything. So think about that when we talk about management. So 10 minutes, please. Oh, gosh, okay. So we have uh, 150 days. Look at this. We draw a line right here at 150 days. And we see that... The percent of days with zero covers, the percent of days with three or more covers, and they're about the same until you get over 150, and then you seem to have a shift. The number of inactive days is significantly reduced in comparison with the days where they have three or more covers. But that's, look at, you can breed up to 150 mares, and, and, and you're not challenging the stallion a lot. Another thing that you can do, this is something that um, our, our colleague Terry Blanchard there at Texas A&M, who just retired, and we sure miss him there, he had looked at, at some stallions and some mares and just looked at stallions and, that had a per cycle pregnancy rate that varied between about 40 to 70 percent per cycle, and then he just plotted them here and showed that for 125 mares, on average, the stallion had about 210 covers. So that's going to be important to look at as we talk about it. Thoroughbred stallions, you can look at the percentage that are pregnant on the farm, the, the mares that are pregnant with pickup semen that is picked up at the farm and mares are bred the same day versus semen that's shipped. That's an important figure to know. This is an important figure to know especially when you delve into it because you find out that the mares that are bred on the farm are bred with fresh semen and cool stored semen, indicating that there's a lot of farm variation. So it's not the conditions the semen was processed and stored in, it's the conditions of how the semen was handled at another location. Four-year-old stallion. We'll just go through this stallion really quickly. He had a 59% seasonal pregnancy rate. That's something that you don't want to have. In the quarter horse industry, they have guaranteed breedings. But a guaranteed breeding means that if they don't get pregnant that year, the owner has an opportunity to breed that mare back the following year. So you get a lot of rebreed. You'll have 60 or more mares that are coming back for rebreeds. Semen quality looked really bad. Motility looked bad. Morphology looked bad. What could we do to help that horse? Well, we looked at a lot of things to try to improve this horse's semen quality. We subjected the semen to a process we called cushion centrifugation. We subjected it to a density gradient called Equipure that separates out most of the good sperm from the bad sperm. Most of the bad sperm stay up on top, 
It, sends, it separates them based on density of the sperm, isopicnic points, so most of the good sperm go to the bottom. Well, look at the values. If you, if you just look at total motility and progressive motility and fresh semen here, you can see these values for total motility and progressive motility are much better than they are with simple cushion centrifugation or with dilution and extender. Very importantly, if we did subject the horse to centrifugation techniques, we looked at him in his own seminal plasma versus a control, and look how much faster the sperm are moving in the control stallion seminal plasma. We look at it after 24 hours, we look at different storage concentrations, but basically we see motility looks better in after it's been exposed to this density gradient and, mo and velocity looks higher whenever we put it in the fertile control seminal plasma. What does it do? Well, one of the things that it does is, is allows the methodology to remove head abnormalities. It went from, in this one ejaculant, from five to one. Mid-piece abnormalities, swollen mid-pieces from 28 to 6 percent, bent mid-pieces 13 to 3, bent tails 19 to 5. So it really cleans up the sperm such that he had 76 percent morphologically normal as opposed to 40. Well, that's in the laboratory. What happens when you breed with it? Well, in this instance, we, don't, we didn't do any contemporary controls with this, but we have a stallion that we knew over an entire breeding set season had a 59% seasonal pregnancy rate. We breed some mares with some Equipure treated sperm with 100 million sperm and 200. We're using 250 microliters or a half a mil. And look at the pregnancy rate when we bred them to these fertile recipient mares. So as a result, they took them back home we talked to them about the technique. They bred 212 mares to them, had a 91% seasonal pregnancy rate and a 62% pregnancy rate per cycle. So you can help stallions under these kinds of conditions. Um, how much time we got? About five minutes? Okay. We have uh, another technique that can be used that I, that I think is really handy, and it's the same technique that was used for the breeding records. If they get pregnant, plus one, don't get pregnant, minus one. And you can apply that technique with any laboratory measure you would like to use using this cumulative summation procedure. And you can do that on an, on an Excel program. Like if it goes straight across, the pregnancy rate is 50%, right? Horizontal line, so just keep that in mind. If it goes up, it's greater than 50%. The steeper the angle, the higher the pregnancy rate. So what you can do is sort. You can, you can plot motility, for instance, sperm viability, the number of sperm you breed a mare with, and plot it. And it'll, it'll go to a certain level, and then it climbs. And you'll see that in this project. This is one that, that uh, Charlie Love led. We actually had a student that, that did this with semen that had arrived at a big embryo transfer facility in Oklahoma. So we got the data from it, and we found, for instance, the threshold for total motility on the farm or at the embryo transfer facility after it was shipped was 65%. The fertility was 53% over all of these stallions in the high fertility stallions it was 67% using the cutoff, 50, 50, 50, 50, and all of a sudden it shoots up. Progressive motility, you have values for it of 45%, viability 71, morphologically normal sperm 47. The total sperm that you inseminate with, the total modal sperm you inseminate with, so this allows you with a given horse, if you look at that data for a horse for a season, do it from them and you can tell whether or not you're sending out too many sperm. Are you wasting sp sperm? Do you need to send more sperm? You can learn a lot from these types of studies. Okay, first year breeding stallions. We have a stallion that comes to us for the first time. Um, 
we, an owner asks, how many mares can the stallion breed? Well, libido comes into the equation. Mating ability comes into the equation. But if you just measure the testicles, find out his daily sperm output, you rarely have an opportunity to actually collect semen from these stallions to establish what their daily sperm output is. But you can extrapolate it from the testicles. The bigger the testicular size, the more sperm would be produced as long as the increase in testicular size is normal testicular parenchyma. So daily sperm output, rule of thumb. In the thoroughbred world, I recommend we have a minimum of one billion sperm, uh, a little safety zone with one and a half billion sperm. So a stallion that has a certain size testicle, for instance, that produces daily sperm output to four and a half uh, to five billion sperm a day, should be able to handle three covers a day if they're evenly spaced and he'll have one and a half billion sperm when that stallion breeds the mare if he's ejaculating properly. So, but look at this, covering times might be at seven in the morning, then 2 p.m. and then 7 p.m. So you, you don't have it equally distributed over a 24 hour time period. So how can, how can that work then? Well, if we apply this, we know how many sperm a stallion produces per second. We can determine how many per hour and then plug that into the formula and at seven hours we still are in a safety zone and we're kind of in the acceptable lower range of the zone there. Uh-oh, I think that means we're ready to go. So I've got to just show you this. This is what I love to do. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs>